No matter who we are, no matter where we live, our rights are still under attack. The pandemic has set back the fight for full equality. Girls and women are paying a higher price. Women are almost two times as likely to lose their jobs in the pandemic. Women do three times more unpaid care and domestic work than men. Gender-based violence is on the rise. In some countries, women's calls to domestic violence helplines have increased five times. Over 11 million girls might not return to school due to COVID-19. It's time to take action. We won't recover anyway until we are equal everywhere. I pledge to take action. I pledge to take action. I pledge to take action. Me comprometo a actuar. I pledge to take action. And I pledge to take action for girls and women. To stand together in solidarity. To lift every voice and declare, we won't stop until girls and women are equal everywhere. Good morning, everyone, and to all of you joining from across the world today. Good afternoon, good evening, and some, for some of you, good midnight. But thank you for being here today at day three of the Youth Activism Accelerator sessions in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, my name is Jeevika, and I'm a national gender youth activist, and I've seen some of you for the last two days, and I'm really excited to see you here uh, today as well. I just wanted to quickly say that we are, we are co-organizing this as youth with UN Women, uh, Asia and the Pacific, and we look forward to some interesting dialogues today on day three of this session, um, you know, where we're looking at action. You know, we've been ideating, we've been thinking, we've been sort of looking at what can be done. So here's day three where we're looking at action. I also want to just uh, draw your attention to interpretation. Uh, can I request for the interpretation to just be projected as well? At the bottom of your screen, you will see an interpretation button. We request you to, um, Click on the language interpretation button and select the language of your choice. We have Bahasa, Chinese, uh, Mandarin, Hindi, French, and English. Even if you want to continue in English, I would request you to uh, click on English because we do have speakers from different parts of the region um, today. There's also sign language interpretation available on the screen. And last but not the least, there's also closed captions for those who prefer subtitles. You can enable your Zoom settings to either switch it on or switch it off. And if you have any issues with interpretation during the session, just text the host or text Floy. He's part of the tech, they're part of the tech team. So just make sure you're reaching out to us. So welcome once again. I hope you selected your interpretation before we go on. Um, I just wanted to also um, reiterate some housekeeping rules before we begin the day. Um, you know, just some announcements around etiquettes. Uh, I request you to keep your mic muted at all points. We are not muting you because we want to have this as interactive as possible as youth, um, but request you to just be respectful of each other's space and ideas. And also uh, remember that this is a safe space. So if you feel uncomfortable or you feel there's a challenge at any point of time, bring it to us and we'll sort of mediate with you. Um, also, please feel free to enter your chat, uh, questions and comments in the chat box. And we'd love to hear your introduction. So anyone who's joined yesterday, day before, do it, reintroduce yourself today and some of you I can see new faces in the room, so we'd love to know where you're coming from. And it's great you're joining on the Day of Action if you're joining today. And also, you've consented to the meeting being recorded, just reminding you, while it's a safe space, we are recording for um, the region purpose, purposes. So just, yeah, with that, I just want to continue with saying welcome once again. We look forward to this day. And I request for um, just a quick um, agenda to be sort of uh, put up on the screen for day three as we go ahead. As you can see, we have some exciting sessions lined up. We are going to do a check-in because, you know, we've had two intense days um, and we'll invite Jotsna in with us uh, from Gender at Work to do this bit. And then, of course, we're going to look at some processes and opportunities and strategies for engagement. How can we have a youth space without actually looking at how youth can engage with these spaces? And we must have it generationally. Uh, so welcome to the YTF and Action Coalition Youth Leaders and other civil society leaders who've come in for this bit. 
um yeah we do plan a break but we plan an exciting break after that uh, where we do have some young activists who have come in to talk about dis uh, disability gender inclusion gender equality and what have they been doing in jet processes and beyond to make this happen across the world because i think we need to learn from each other across the world as we deepen this work in the region and then finally we have a you know the second part of the day which is a you know a scaling for impact looking at different organizations who have been doing great work we could learn from look at further action and then come to what is our call for action what do we want to do today um so yeah welcome everybody uh, lovely to see you here and we're going to quickly go on to our first segment which is like where are you all today where are we all today it's just welcoming jyotsna jyotsna is the india lead of gender at work um also a very very dear ally and friend from the feminist movements and the queer movement she's also a strong uh, advocate of speaking about issues of caste equality queer politics also looking at working on issues of feminist leadership and movement building so welcome again jyotsna um you know i just wanted to check in with you what's been resonating with you of you know day 1 day 2 <clears throat> any initial comments on and uh, everyone else you can also chat it put it into chat as well what's been sitting on your mind of day 1 day 2 yeah um, good morning everyone and i'm very happy to be here uh, it's a pleasure to be interacting with all of you spread across different parts of the world so um it's it's a pleasure to be to be talking to you and and also will listen uh, your thoughts on um uh feminist values principles so we started on day 1 to talk about um feminist values and some of the things that came up um was the need for compassion empathy um and uh, uh the collective uh, the voice uh strengthening the collective strengthening the collective resistance voice um and to center love in our practices um i think second day was more so moving towards uh deepening uh, those values and going again beyond just the number honing the power within and the intersectionality uh, i think was something that resonated with us on day 2 as well and i think uh, we are on day 3 where we are looking at call call for action so um we can probably discuss a little bit of feminist values in that context today i think absolutely jyotsna day 2 was a deep dive into what are our leaders doing on different thematics how do we look at it in the thematics as you said you know all these intersectionality deepening bringing it to the grassroots listening to community voices and i'm sure as we go into the call for action and looking at our agenda in the region for the next 5 years and beyond we are definitely going to bring in some of this so i just want to request for um, all of you to open menti.com because you know today we want, we do have a little more time to cheer you early in the morning um so menti.com if we can just uh, project it as well and just look at what is meaningful youth participation and call to action look like for you what are you calling for action on in your region what do you think is important um you know just wanted to hear from all of you what does it look like when we call our government for action when we ask the state to be accountable when we ask for you know action in communities action in the private sector action in the feminist spaces action for yourselves within youth action intergenerationally just some ideas um the code is 2481 3486 um do take a little while and anyone who wants to sort of also speak about what is the action that they think about put up your hand and we will take in some responses today mm. yeah just now you know what are you thinking about when you know we say action You know, I think yeah I was just uh, I was just thinking about that before you asked me so thanks uh um I think uh, one of the things that we were also been talking is um to take some of these difficult conversations back to our circle of influence back to our intimate spaces um to people that we are close to and these are more informal spaces however extremely challenging and difficult to talk about you know some of these uh, gender equality equity and uh, talking to that to your family to your friends sometimes can be really difficult so uh, i think for me it would probably be how do you engage with people that you know or you're close to um on deeper political issues um but at the same time i think 
I'm a fan of holding governments accountable. And I think that that's, that's where a lot of our effort has to be through our collective voices, through our collective resistance. Um, but what do you think? Yeah, I think it's interesting that we can hold both together. I just want to hear, you know, what others think as well. I can see some things on the space, not be tokenistic, be heard freely. How do we do that in government spaces? If there was one call for action you'd like us to develop collectively, what is it going to be? We are 95 voices in the room. We've got to have more, you know, call for action in our own region to take this locally as well and, you know, speak up loudly globally. Um, so, yeah, if anyone else wants to sort of raise their hand and come in on this bit. Um, you know, where are you looking at action in your region? What are you looking from governments? Um, just unmute yourself otherwise. Anyone wants to come in? I can see some very interesting comments around meaningful engagement and representative, you know, representation of youth. Uh, most marginalized youth coming in, comfortable being listened. Um, break the silence, it says in Hindi, in case some of you are wondering. Oh, bring up your voices, leading their own agenda. Um, you know, youth leading their own agenda, having a platform. And I think that speaks to the thing of a network, a collective. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting to look at some of this. Do any of you want to just come in, unmute yourselves, um, introduce yourselves and just say what your call for action is. We'd love to hear your voices. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just going to call in somebody to come in. I know it's early morning in the Asia region for a lot of, a lot of us, but... Okay, um, Zara, since you are going to be leading the session on intergovernmental processes, do you want to come in on this one? What's your call for action? Zara, are you in the room? Yes, I am. Hi, Julie. Come on in. Good morning. Um, I guess for me, um, youth participation essentially implements an intersectional approach throughout um, the inclusivity of young people. I think sometimes when we look at youth participation, it is very narrow and we do often see the same voices within the same spaces all the time. So for me, when I look at um, what unraveling true youth participation looks like, it is about emphasizing every voice, regardless of the identities that young people hold. It's about creating those spaces for voices that have been left behind within the narrative for change. So for me, it's about paving those opportunities for the institutional barriers that are in place that limit young people across a diversity of backgrounds from actually creating meaningful differences. So how can we do that? I guess it's just all about um, extending your arm and bringing other young people with you in this narrative for change that we are all fighting for. Yeah, you've nailed it, I think, Zara. As a, and Zara is a Generation Equality Youth Task Force member. She's going to be leading the next session on uh, looking at, you know, how do we engage with government processes, intergovernmental processes, take this forward in our region and be moderating that session. But it's great to see you, Zara, sort of advocating for meaningful participation across identities and spaces. Thank you for that. I also see, um, you know, some very interesting comments about engaging freely, collective voice, designing with youth, not only designing for youth, but with youth. It's interesting that some of the thematics, this, all of this seems to cut across thematics. You know, we are not focusing on silos anymore. We're asking for holistic responses and that's great. Uh, Jyotsna, anything that resonates with you? And anyone else after Jyotsna who wants to come in? Um, I think uh, a lot of things that we've been discussing is, is featuring here, right? Um, but I think uh, somebody saying youth leading their own agendas in an enabling environment, I think that's really uh, a good one because um, here we're also talking about the process. So not just the, um, the deliverables and the call for action, but again, I think what feminist uh, values and principles emphasize is on the process. So how does the process can also be enabling, inclusive, intersectional, and, and more sensitive so that whoever we are bringing in um, are able to sort of um, find resonance in, in that environment and take take the fight forward. I think absolutely taking, taking this forward is so important. And with that, um, does anyone else want to come in for quick comments? Just unmute yourself. You know, we're leaving it open. Not being you... afraid to be jailed, somebody wrote. I think that's... Yeah, I think it's important for our re region to recognize those yes. sort of human rights defenders, people at the margins who've been sort of fighting 
for youth rights, for gender equality and facing repercussions as well. I think that's very, very important coming in. What, how do we collectively look at that? Um, yeah, so I think with that, how do we move on to engagement? Um, you know, and I think I want to hand over to Zara for the next session where we're actually looking at, you know, intergovernmental processes, looking at processes, youth participation, um, and we have an exciting panel, of, which is both local and global, sort of commenting on this. So Zara from the Generation Equality Youth Task Force and a member from Australia, who's been leading this in Asia and the Pacific. Over to you for the next bit of this. And just to say there's interpretation for all of those who joined late. Uh, we also request you to keep your mics on mute at all times. Thank you so much, Divika, and I think I speak on behalf of the group for your wonderful moderation for the earlier session today and the commitment and the hard work that you also put in in enhancing gender equality, especially within our region of the Asia Pacific. But I guess moving on to my session, I welcome everyone here today. Um, my name is Zara Al-Jawali and I'm a member of the YWCA, Young Women's Council of Australia. I'm also a Multicultural Youth Advocacy Network Ambassador and I currently sit on the core group of the Generation Equality, um, uh, Generation Equality um, Framework. So I guess for me, I represent the Youth Task Force um, right now with my fellow colleague, Sylvain, which you can see on the screen as well. And it is an absolute privilege to be um, in this space um, and representing young people across the world in our fights for gender equality. I have the privilege of joining you here today to moderate this session, um, session five, which today we'll be discussing how young people can effectively engage in influencing decision-making processes at a national, regional, and global level, including intergenerational spaces and intergovernmental spaces. This is to strengthen state accountability on commitments that they have made. Over the last two days, I'm sure we've discussed what feminist activism means like in feminist leaders for social transformation. Yesterday, we explored with different organizations how young people are leading change in different areas from economic justice and rights, feminist action for climate change, gender-based violence, technology and innovation for gender equality, climate justice, and women, peace and security. So as you can see, we've got a plethora of different topics that we've discussed, which are all equally meaningful in paving the way forward for building back a future that is equal and equitable for every last one of us. This first session looks at how we can actually strengthen state accountability, however, and what opportunities we can do to leverage and how we can do this. We will be hearing from so many incredible speakers that I've had the privilege of working with. But over the next 50 minutes, we will hear from space from them about the spaces that we can leverage and effective strategies we can apply in doing so. We will have an opportunity to listen to speakers, work with or lead women's rights, youth and adolescent focused organizations and networks. I would like to invite now all of our panelists to please switch on their camera if they have not done so already. I'll briefly be introducing the panel as I invite them to take their spotlight. But before we begin, I'm just going to give you a brief overview about who our panelists are today. We have the wonderful and the formidable um, Darren Paul, Deputy Chair, Y Plus Global and Generation Equality Youth Task Force member, who is an absolute catalyst in building a um, in building back a future that is equitable for especially young activists within the generation equality um, space. We have Naini Singh, Executive Director of the Fiji Women's Rights Movement, who is an incredible um, individual paving forward change within the Pacific um, region. And we have the incredible Chamathia Fernando, who served as a youngest member of the World Board of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts and ge the Generation Equality Youth Task Force member, who is an absolutely incredible individual that I've had the pleasure of working with over the past two years. And finally, we have um, Zinia Kauna, co-founder, advocacy and policy coordinator and the youth, a, a part of the Youth Feminist Europe, who once again, another formidable young woman that is creating change within the spaces of gender equality. We have some questions for the panel, but we all also welcome your uh, reactions in the Zoom chat. So please feel free to pop forward any questions as we go through and we'll definitely collect those and we can answer them later on. 
We would invite, um, so how this is gonna work is that we're gonna invite the panelists to take up around six minutes with their response. And then um, the time at the end will be allocated to um, inviting questions within the Zoom chat. So just reiterating, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat box as we go through. Um, just again, reiterating what um, Javika mentioned earlier, we also have um, language interpretation available. You have support from a team of interpreters in the languages of Mandarin, Hindi, and Bahasa. Also a reminder to participants that there is a Zoom chat box feature for them to engage with. And on that, they need to be respectful. As we start, we invite the panelists to please check the chat for any interesting comments within their intervention. And I guess before we begin, um, I would now like to hand over to the incredible um, Darren Paul um, from the Generation Equality Forum um, and the Generation Equality Youth Task Force, who I've had the privilege with again for working over the past um, two years. So Darren, um, if you can please unmute yourself and warmly um, give us a brief introduction of who you are, but I've also got a quick question for you um, within, the within your introduction. Um, as Deputy Chair, Y Plus Global and Generation Equality Youth Task Force member, and following the recent conclusion of the Generation Equality Forum in Paris, what are some lessons that you can share about how young people were able to ensure that their voices were heard and that they were meaningly participating in these processes? Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zara. And thank you for having me in this wonderful and amazing discussions on intergovernmental processes and, and how to involve young people in the process. So um, let me start by saying, you know, our experience with the recent Generation Equality Forum in Paris was, it's actually a mix of, you know, pros and cons, but for me, it's merely a disaster in so many levels. You know, the mere fact that young people and adolescents could not access the platform, by the way, that's the first one, that we are already been deprived of an amazing opportunity to voice out and raise our and raise our concerns pertaining to gender equality. And it was not only that, you know, when our speakers from the youth task force and also the national gender youth activists were cut short. It was a testament as well that they are silencing our voices. And I, I actually feel sad because, you know, I mean, we have been preparing and coordinating for the forum in the last few weeks and also in the last few, few months. And they said that everything will, will be fine. But unfortunately, you know, the platform is outrageously disappointing during the last, you know, during the three days of the forum. You know, I'm also going to quote one of my colleagues who was invited in the opening ceremony of the of the Paris Forum. You know, she said that unfortunately we have once again witnessed tokenism at its highest. Youth were invited as speakers to the conference, but it seems like we were there as a window for decorations. You know, you know, I just wanted to point out that um, a lot of young people were were cut off. You know after a series of you know sessions and you know i also wanted to point out that you know um other older generations or 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 other government officials were given more you know um time to speak you know during the sessions uh, during the sessions in the paris forum so looking back at what happened you know i have five five important lessons from the Generation Equality Forum in Paris to make sure that voices are, to make sure that young people's voices are heard and that we are meaningfully and ethically engaged in the process. So the, I think the first one um, that I wanted to emphasize is, you know, young people have valuable skills and knowledge and we do have a very diverse levels of experiences. So I, I think, you know, it's it's really important you know to include young people from a range of skills and knowledge you know instead of focusing only with years of experience um you know i've during the forum i i've saw a lot of young people who were already invited before so i think it's now i think you know for the next forum if there will be a next forum or a next session on generation equality i think it would be really interesting to invite people who who are 
who are underrepresented, who are unheard, who are coming from um, you know, rural and remote areas for them to also speak their concerns and also their, their issues. And then the second one I wanted to point out is, you know, um, the demographics in different communities across the country are changing younger generation and it has becoming more diverse. You know, you know, I think, you know, um, for the for the whole generation equality framework and and also the the processes that goes with it, I think it is important to consider targeted messages for different youth groups, you know, as, as we are very diverse. You know, I think it would also be nice to to talk about race, you know, um, you know, pretending that it does not impact the issue that we're trying to to address, you know, and we we also have to emphasize that people of color are 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 as important as any other racial and and ethnic groups or or any other vulnerable populations out there. And uh, my third point, um, you know, um, to make space at the table for different use perspectives youth perspectives, um, we should reach out to different stakeholders. You know, I remember in the GEF Paris, I have, you know, um, there's a huge lack of representation. Again, I'm going to say it again from those young people and adolescents who are coming from rural and remote areas. I think it's now high time to amplify their voices and concerns. And then um, the fourth one, which is really interesting. You know, the idea that young people do not have as much to contribute to contribute as adults is ingrained in our culture. You know, we have so much things to learn, you know. You know, um, we can learn from each other, we can learn from adults, we can learn from other peers, from from other stakeholders out there. I think we should be treated as leaders right now. And and we are already leaders. I think there are still room for improvement and also for growth, but we are we are taking our space. We are leaders, and um, I think we should be involved in the whole process as itself. And then um, the fifth uh, the fifth one, which is I, I felt the most important, is you know, um, you know, during the GF Paris, um, it's not merely acceptable that we are only just invited or you know to give a speech for around three to five minutes for three to five minutes or maybe putting our photos in their campaign website or giving us a stage to speak i think it's not meaningful engagement for me meaningful engagement is if we are at the center of the process and i think it's important for world leaders, government representatives, and also civil society organizations to partner with us, you know, to fund us, to involve us in all the processes. And of course, we, we just don't want to be in the picture. We want to be in the whole process itself. So again, I'm going to end my speech by saying that youth engagement is the result when young people are not only involved in responsible, challenging actions to create positive change, but also leading and co-creating the process. Thank you. And over to you, Zara. Thank you so much, Darren, for your incredible intervention. I can wholeheartedly resonate with you. And as someone who has worked with you over the past two years on the Generation Equality Youth Task Force, I resonate so deeply with all that you've said. I think with Darren and I, with um, well, context to all those listening, Darren and I have definitely worked together in navigating some of the biggest challenges, including um, fighting for young people's remuneration for their time, um, including young people across all levels of decision-making. Unfortunately, um, young people for too long, and it's still manifesting to this day, have been utilized as just the token for inclusivity per se. But unfortunately, we've just, it's, it's no longer enough if we're the individuals that are paving the way forward and if our time is being utilized for free, it is up to us and it is up to leaders to 
also um, extend their helping hand and meet us in the center of the middle to ensure that we are creating inclusive spaces. And I think with that point, I'd like to now introduce Nalina Singh, um, the um, uh, Fiji, uh, sorry, apologies, um, the executive director of the Fiji's Women Rights Movement. Um, um, Nalina, um, I think that you can definitely provide a unique perspective to this as you have been working in the region of um, Fiji for over the past 20 years. And I think that this especially ties into what um, Darren Paul has been talking about. But I guess I'd like to ask you how you would say the space of civil society engagement within the 20 years has evolved, especially in the context of COVID-19 and what that means for the efforts to strengthen and sustain the civil society engagement in governmental processes within the region um, in particular. I'd also like to um, ask you as well, how we can, um, how can other actors support some of these efforts as well? Over to you, Nalina. Thank you so much, uh, Zara and, um... Uh, you know, big bula uh from Fiji to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we're in the throes of uh, internet issues, um, you know, being in a small developing country and everyone's working from home. So <laughs> the bandwidth doesn't survive too long. But, um, you know, Zara, thank you so much for the question. And let me say that I wholeheartedly support what Darren has said. Um, uh, I was not involved in the Generation Equality Forum discussions for many reasons, um, but uh, you know, talking to my colleagues in the women's rights movement and listening to both sides, those that were involved and those that um, were watching from the sidelines, I wholeheartedly do um, agree with your comments because um, if Generation Equality Forum was for uh, you know, the next generation, for you, know, you all, um, then uh, it definitely has mixed a few marks. But I am asked to speak about what, uh, you know, has sort of happened um, in the past. So Zara, I can't go 20 years, um, but I can go definitely 10 years. Huh? So just bear with me as I build my story. Um, so, you know, we all understand and agree that the crisis brought on by COVID-19 has made it, uh, clearer than ever that uh, we are all connected and that our quest to overcome it um, cannot afford to leave anyone out. You know, this means, this has meant many things for us in the women's rights movement uh, in the sense that we've had to quickly change the way we work internally and with those that we serve, uh, pivot our plans to work on areas which appeared rather gapingly large as issues bring the voices of those affected to the forefront to provide the services much needed as many suffered and continue to suffer amongst the few things that we have had to do. Um, but just recently, uh, when I was reading a reflection from a prominent women's rights group on how last they said, it seems that the multilateral institution appeared to be frozen in time without the capacity to respond creatively to the crisis or to turn out recommendations amounting to anything more than business as usual. We could see this from the raising of participation occurred for key important meetings for all women and one being the Generation Equality Forum. But before I move further, I wanted to touch on multilateral spaces and what it means. And in our case, this is the UN. So it's a space for member states as duty bearers and us as rights holders, and the purpose is for enhanced accountability on human rights commitments. So with that understanding, we will all think that there cannot be spaces convened under the UN or spaces without us, right? Yes, but the facts differ greatly. I remember uh, the Asia Pacific review processes for Beijing, BPFA, and ICPD at their 15 year, 20 year, 25 year anniversaries. Those were moments where we saw strength from civil society, steering committee organizing, where uh, steering committee organizing the civil society forums, uh, negotiate with various, uh, you know, UN agencies to have more and more civil society participation. So on one hand, while we gained momentum on having more people 
in the CSO forums for women and youth deliberating and putting forward recommendations to be put forward into formal spaces, we almost saw the opposite happen in the formal when the formal negotiations began. Suddenly we were not allowed in those spaces. Yeah, and the negotiations became top secret. Uh, our collective efforts have therefore been, uh, you know, to have the space opened up and for duty bearers to be more transparent on what is being said and how the trade-offs happen. So moving that, you know, into the current context of what we are seeing, um, you know, uh, in terms of sidelining for many different reasons. Yeah, one is as you know, was mentioned by Darren, you know, whilst we have technology on our side, but who has access and means to use it? Internet connections right now at the, are at the mercy of a few corporations that provide the services. And we can be lucky enough to have fast bandwidth for an entire day or even for a meeting. I know of some women here in Fiji that we work with, that even if we pay for internet packages, it still does not work properly for Zoom meetings in their safe spaces. Second, um, if we are truly to be inclusive and leave no one behind, then surely we would have thought through the concept of time zones. Our Asia Pacific region is vast. We in the Pacific are often in meetings that are well beyond our waking hours but we try and do what is possible. And I can see same issues, you know, awake at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., you know, when we should be having the rest we're supposed to be and try to be safe from this deadly virus, which actually tells us to rest. Third is creating the space and maintaining it. This seems to be a hard ask. Learning from the past that we must do and we must uh, ensure to co-create new spaces and meaningful spaces for engagement. This all emphasizes the gender gap in terms of access to resources and opportunities. And unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 crisis, we are seeing this gap widen more than ever. The existing systemic and structural barriers continue to shrink the spaces for civil society to effectively and efficiently uh, be part of pertinent discussions. So my last couple of minutes will be on, so what can be done? Um, one, more useful use of resources during these times. Exactly what you were talking about, Zara. We need to pay for time, you know, because that is what is needed. Many who have lost jobs, you know, in our families, and we must be acknowledging that, you know, time and effort needs to be uh, you know, accommodated for. So what have we seen work for us in the Pacific uh, for some of our coalition meetings is that we provide for travel, safe accommodation and venues, stable internet access for those that need it. This requires time and planning, but it definitely works. With some ingenious program planning and agenda setting, we have you know, the full participation. You know, then this is truly, we are not leaving anyone behind. Second, for more inclusivity, this is definitely more work, but it can be done to ensure that we divide the regions and hold the meetings where everyone needed can participate. Now, this is in the case of multilateral institutions like the UN. UN agencies can have greater involvement of their sub-regional and country offices who can lead sub-regional and national processes, which can then feed into larger meetings. The principle of inclusion must be at the heart of all efforts if we we're aiming to have meaningful participation. Third, getting creative. We have a plethora of applications and programs that we can use, but we must ensure that those are disability friendly and user friendly as well. So preparation time is also part of the formal gatherings that we have. And finally, we must not give up, definitely not now. The women's rights movement has worked together with the youth movement on many issues, and we must continue on this journey with all the modalities that are thrown at us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nani, for your intervention. I think as a fellow Pacific sister, I can totally resonate with you when you say paying for our time. I, I, I like you, probably have sat in meetings at 3 a.m just waiting to be the token voice from the Pacific um, and just kind of also being that youth token voice. So I think it's 
very, it's sentiment, it's this testament within itself, apologies, but our time is often not really considered and rather I think that it is just that check boy, check um, box that is just being fulfilled. Um, thank you so much again for your uh, suggestions and your strategies and I think that truly with um, the power of creating um, space in terms of working with people at the grassroots we can definitely create that reform that we are after. Um, I now have the privilege of introducing um, Tomatia Fernando, one of the greatest um, youth activists that I've had the privilege of working with. Um, aforementioned, Tomatia was the um, youngest member of the World Association and Girl Guides Board, and she has definitely created so much change within the short time that I've known her as well. Um, Tomatia, I invite you to now unmute yourself and to um, introduce yourself briefly, but my question to you is, what are some of the assumptions people make about girls and what are the missed opportunities when we do not um, engage with our adolescent girls? And as well as that, as someone who has worked with the World um, Association, um, how has the World Association ensured that the voices of girls and adolescents get, are captured in decision-making processes? And what can we learn from in their example? Thank you, Zara. And hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone joining from across the world. Uh, first, firstly, I think both, um, you know, UN Women Asia and the Pacific Office and also the, all the young people involved in organizing this space. I think huge congratulations to bringing this voice and creating this platform. Uh, just to you know, give context to what I'm going to speak about, I am Chamatea Fernando and based in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Um, I have been uh, working in advocacy and, and as a youth activist in the past almost nine years. So for me, I think I also started as an 18, 19 year old uh, attending the 57 CSW, Commission on the Status of Women, back in 2013. And I think from there onwards, I started getting involved in this, uh, you know, you know, Commission on the Status of Women process, but also World Conference on Youth, Beijing Plus 20 review process that happened in 2014-15. And then of course in, in uh, Beijing Plus 25 review process uh, that happened in 2019-2020. In uh, and of course in the generation equality uh, process because, because of my involvement in the, in the youth task force. So over the years, when I was, you know, engaged in, in, in different uh, global, regional and uh, national, um, you know, intergovernmental processes, something that I've noticed is the lack of, uh, you know, adolescent and youth engagement across all these spaces. But of course, I must also highlight that generation equality seemed when compared to those other experiences, by far, you know, one of the most engaging spaces, but not forgetting, I think, like Darren highlighted initially, the, the kind of experiences we've come across really made us feel, you know, are we really uh, talking about meaningful adolescent and youth engagement because at some points we felt extremely tokenized and we felt like you know we are being used as this voice to say oh we've ticked the box we've got the youth engagement done but I think it's it's about like you you uh, raised in the question itself how what are the kind of assumptions people come with especially when speaking about adolescent and, and especially adolescent girl uh, engagement in these processes, because I'm also representing uh, the largest voluntary organization for girls and young women with 10 million in 152 member countries, the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. Um, we've come across spaces where we really wanted to ensure that our girls and young women are able to you know, have their voices heard. How are they going to be involved in these spaces? So one of the you know, not necessarily assumption, I feel people have myths and, and beliefs that they think uh, adolescent girls are not ready, uh, they're not knowledgeable enough, or they do not have the experience, or they do not have the capacity to be in such decision making uh, spaces. I think it's, it's important to break those in the first place, because I feel adolescent girls also come with their own set of experiences. They're also extremely, um, you know, opinionated, and they know exactly what they're talking about. I'm also coming with the background of having worked with girls from the ages of 11 years to 30 years within my team itself from different countries across the globe because we are a global movement. So I know that they're ready to be 
taking part in all these processes. So I think it's important that we break these myths and beliefs people have that they're not ready and, and you know, you need to further kind of strengthen. They're already ready and prepared to take over the world. So, you know, let's just get that uh, clarified in the first place. Uh, the next part is around how do we then ensure that they're able to meaningfully engage? Because we do not want, you know, them just putting an adolescent girl in any kind of a decision-making body just to tick a box. We want them to be you know, heard and also their, their voices to be taken into consideration. So in that case, how do we build their capacities? So, so to address some of these questions, I would bring in some of the examples from my organization itself. So one of the, the areas that we touch upon is girl-led advocacy. So we usually have, um, you know, comprehensive package of having advocacy toolkit, uh, trainings that, you know, girls and young women would go through that then it kind of automatically prepares them to be able to take part in those intergovernmental processes. So from you know, connect networking to connecting with their uh, national uh, delegations to how do they influence decision makers? What are the kind of key messages and call to actions you would ask for? Because especially when you're reviewing policies and you ask for changes in, in certain policies, you need to give a little bit of technical awareness of what, what we, are, we will be asking for as, as a global movement or you know, as the voices of girls and young women around the world. So you need to kind of strengthen their capacity, give them the, the tools to be able to, you know, really claim their place, spaces in, uh, in, in, the, in the whole wide world. So also, I think it's important to give them that experience from starting from a national level to how do you move to regional to global level? Because it's, it's also, you, don't, you won't come, you know, you just won't wake up tomorrow and be like all ready to take up the whole world. You, you also gradually improve with your experience to understand what are the, some of the issues that are prevalent around the world. Because especially us as a global movement, when we have a delegation at, at a commission on the status of women or COP or women deliver, we want those girls to be able to speak about issues and, um, you know, experiences of girls around the world. So if even if they come from one country, they would be speaking about the issues that generally what girls and, and young women are going through. So you need to kind of build their capacity, give them that knowledge and give them the skills training to be able to uh, really ensure that their, their, their participation is meaningful. The next point is around how do, how, how do we see this, some of these structural barriers? For example, sometimes people avoid involving adolescents below the age of 18 years. Why I'm focusing on the age of uh, below the age of 18 is, you know, sometimes you find that always people try to say, okay, above 16 or above 18, but not necessarily that younger age group. Sometimes they do not have that safeguarding policies and adolescent engagement uh, structures in place. So they quickly move to that easy path of having just you know, the, the, the convenient way of engaging. But I think it's about us creating that environment so that we could bring those voices into the table. Uh, and I think it's also important to emphasize here, adolescent girls are, you know, they face double discrimination because of their gender and because of their age. And we need to know that when we speak about girls and women's you know, issues, we need to bring their voices to the table because they come with their experience. We do not want anybody else to be speaking for them on behalf of them and, you know, saying these are the type of problems. We need their voices to be in the table. Um, and, and when we say about meaningful engagement, not necessarily in consultations, because we always see that adolescent girls, people create this space, meetings, consultations to get their voices, but not necessarily really putting them into the decision-making space itself. I think it's right time now we start involving, engaging them in the decision-making spaces itself. And for that, of course, we need to go help them build their capacities, have the skills, have the tools, have the infrastructure ready for them to be able to participate in that space. So with that, I think I kind of captured some of the practices that we have, uh, starting from girl-led advocacy to advocacy toolkits, trainings that as a global movement that we get our girls to go through and then get them ready to, you know, kind of um, start their building their own, own kind of advocacy campaigns and how they would really reach out to their, their governmental authorities, how to reach, you know, to their delegations from their countries and then together work on that, uh, you know, strategy of really influencing decision makers. Uh, but I also want to emphasize here that it's, it's very, very critical 
that we create brave and safe spaces for adolescents to be engaging. Because I think rightly emphasized by Darren itself, it's important that adolescents are also involved and co-owning that space or rather co-designing, co-leading those spaces. And I think something we heard even at the opening ceremony from one of our own um, you know, Youth Task Force members, Julieta from Chile, and she's an adolescent girl and a huge voice uh, you know, and doing amazing work was that we do not want adolescent girls to be coming into spaces like this just to click a photo or just to say that, you know, or done. We've got that box ticked. We had an adolescent girl voice in the in the opening ceremony or in the closing ceremony or in a plenary. It's about how girls all over the world have the ability or the accessibility to these spaces and ensuring that it's inclusive, it's diverse, it's representative of all their voices because people come with different experiences and our lived realities could be similar but also could be very different. And we have to see that all these voices are represented and heard and taken into consideration. And when I say taken into consideration, we always see so many manifestos coming up, so many letters coming up, so many call outs coming out, but how many of those are really put into action? Now we need to demand how their voices are really taken into consideration and then put into action. So with that, thank you so much. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Shamathia. I think um, your intervention was absolutely incredible. And I think that um, unfortunately we still have yet to take that intersectional approach, especially within the youth advocacy space. It's time for us to recognize that young people isn't just the 18 to 13 gap. It's about ensuring that we can be accessible to as many as is possible, emphasizing those voices. And I think that using Juliet as an example, I think that that was absolutely revolutionary for the UN women, not revolutionary for Julieta because Julieta is an incredible activist, but it's about recognizing that young people have been here, adolescent girls have always been here, but it's been up to organizations to provide those opportunities for them as well. Now, I guess, um, unfortunately, we do have to skip past one of our panel members um, as um, she is unable to access um, the panel discussion, however, um, I invite everyone in the audience to please um, ask questions um, for the rest of the session. But as we do wait for those questions, um, I would like to now invite all the panelists to um, check the chats for any interesting comments um, that they find from the participants. But I also wanted to do a quick round of our three incredible panelists that have provided us with incredible insights. Um, I would first of all like to pass over to you, um, Darren, and I want to well, this question is for basically everyone, but Darren, I think you can kick us off. Um, I wanted to ask you um, what opportunities for, I wanted to see as opportunities for you to become more engaged in speaking up and being visible in decision-making processes at national, regional and global levels in um, how we can actively do this. Over to you, Darren. Thank you, Zara. Um, I think um, the first thing to do is to widen your network. You know, I started working on a national level. You know, uh, I remember, well, it was way back 10 years ago when I was like 20 years old, I remember. Um, I started working in a faith-based organization here in the Philippines. And I remember during that time, I am a, a super shy guy, you know, with, I couldn't even speak in public. <laughs> and, and, I remember um, one of, of the government representative approached me saying that, you know, um, you know, with all your work and with all your, um, you know, um, um, things that you're raising in, in this technical working group, I think it's now high time for you to speak in front of us and, and share your expertise and your knowledge, you know, in terms of, of, I remember it was a technical working group on HIV and also sexual reproductive health and rights. And I think it was the first time that I conquered my fear, you know, I, and, and I was able to share, you know, what I have been keeping at myself, you know, for the longest time. And it felt good, you know, and I wanted to highlight that because I think it's important for us to grow in so many levels and by, by increasing our network, increasing our reach, and also, you know, um, you know, trying out things that are not comfortable for us, 
you know, and putting ourselves out there, I think that's the first thing to do. And most especially for for adolescents and young people who are who are af- who are afraid to do a lot of things, you know, try to change it differently. You know, ch- try to put yourself out there and try things that makes you somehow uncomfortable. I think it's important to to do that and go out of your comfort zone. So so I think the first thing to do is to go out of your comfort zone and increase your network. So yeah, I hope I was able to answer your question, Zara. Mm-hmm. Beautifully articulated, Darren. And Thank I you. think I definitely agree with you. Um, my journey as well is similar to yours. Um, Darren, I think I started off with grassroots organizations and then I slowly made my way nationally and internationally. And I think that what is so beautiful about this space is you start to realize how important grassroots um, advocacy is as well over time. And that's one of the biggest lessons that I've had in terms of working with the UN and with um, UN at the UN level. So um, just to any youth activists in this space as well, to add on to Darren Paul, I think um, it's also recognizing that every opportunity is room for space. It's not just about taking up those big opportunities that are uh, sought over by the youth across the world. It's about making the most of every single opportunity that you are a part of and realizing that you have the power to create change at all levels, only if you put your mind to it and if you put your heart to it. So thank you, Paul. Um, I now pass over to Nalina for your um, little tips and tricks to fellow audience members. Uh, thanks, Zara. Um, I, I agree with Darren as well, but I have to say that uh, that formula was not something that I followed. Um, I went the other way. Um, uh, my 20 years or most of my 20 years uh, doing the work that I do for women's rights and gender equality um, began from regional international experience. And then I moved into my home country to um, you know, serve the women um, of Fiji and you know, work in the Pacific. Um, so I have to say that you know, we all have to find our different pathways. Um, what fits, uh, some may not be, uh, uh, not for everybody, but you know, opportunities also matter. So as you said, you know, to be grabbing all op- opportunities, um, yes. You know, we, we, we have to do that because um, it, it is, you know, there's so much competition out there for resources, for spaces, for, um, you know, what we have to say, how do you have to say it? And I was, as I was speaking, I was, you know, I was telling you about how the spaces are shrinking, all of that. So we, yes, do have to, um, you know, um, uh, grab the ones that we get to say the things that we need to say. Um, and it definitely greatly helps if it's coming from the constituency based, um, you know, you have not just your voice, but the voice of others with you, because that's what I've realized from the women's movement that, you know, I can have my own experiences, my privilege can speak for, you know, so many things, but does that resonate with everybody else? Um, you know, so that that matters a lot as well. Um, privilege, we all have to be counting our privilege as well. Uh, if we are talking about meaningful participation of everyone and leaving no one behind and being inclusive, you know, disabilities, uh, location, rural, you know, how marginalized do we feel, uh, all the intersectionalities that we can think of. Well, I have to say, at the end of the day, let's not forget what we are up against. You know, we are against patriarchy and the manifestation of patriarchy in so many different ways that we see intersecting with our lives. Yeah, um, it's, it's the way that it, patriarchy intersects with trade and globalization, the way it intersects with power and uh, you know, leads to um, the uh, intensification of uh, militarization or, and fundamentalism. Uh, how does that intersect with the way it curtails on women's rights and on, on your rights as, as young people? Who is there to say that you know, your voice is not um, in, you know, to be coming in at a certain place? So patriarchy, we must not forget that you know, fundamentally at the bottom of it all, we are all fighting that one 
you know, um, ideology that is manifesting in so many different ways uh, in our sub-regions, in our countries, in our communities, and sometimes in our own homes. So, um, you know, and we have over the years, over decades, worked out many different ways of trying to address that. And one of it is through the multilateral um, organizations. And um, I have to say that the progressiveness that the world displayed 25 years ago with ICPD and Beijing and you know so many other things that happened, that has eroded because suddenly um, leaders have realized and um, you know uh, the profit-oriented uh, individuals have realized that that you know rights holders when they get you know what they're asking for it doesn't go well for them so uh, we have to know what we are fighting against and why and how and join the dots uh, you know so that we add on to what is already happening and what has already happened so that we you know continue the fight together it's not you know us versus you know you or we are all in this together working in different ways and um, all I have to say is uh, my last thing would be keep moving forward keep moving forward speak up speak out and use all the platforms available because you know what we are fighting against is um, in many different ways the same thing thanks thank you so much nalini i'm so sorry that i've also butchered your name throughout this panel discussion but um truly appreciate your sentiments and i definitely think that this journey isn't just an individual journey it's up to all of us to collectively work together so again it's also just about taking up those opportunities together and bringing every voice that you can along the way with it um, i now pass on um, chamathia to provide the final comments um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Zara. And I think I definitely agree with both what Darren and Nalini has had to share. And I think it's, it's also about building th those journeys, how we navigate within these processes could be different, uh, you know, and, and the kind of challenges and barriers that might come our way could be different. But I think it's also about how passionate you are to really have your voices heard and you know the kind of issues that you really want emphasized in, in all of these decision, decision, decision making spaces. Um, one experience that I have is you know when I started off as a, as a you know young advocate at just at the age of 18, 19 years, I came across situations where my government was really resistant uh, towards you know even listening to what I had to say. So I had to make sure that it, it was almost like shaking them and saying, you know, this is what I want to see changed in, in, in these policies, in these uh, spaces where you are negotiating with other governments. But of course, th there's so much of, um, you know, friction and and when, especially when you're working with governments and really getting them to hear your voices, it's, it, you come across a situation where they're almost like blind or, or kind of try to neglect your voice or rather, you know, just bypass you and act as if they never heard whatever you said. So I think you come across many of these experiences and, and um, I think it's important for us to reflect upon how we as individuals, as activists, you know, working on different thematic areas could really grab some of these opportunities that come our way and really make sure that all those girls and young women's voices are heard. So I think it's, it's partly it's also I felt, you know, when I was going through this whole experience of really working on some of these thematic areas, I felt that in a way it might not be happening to me, but I also had the responsibility to make sure that those voices are heard, the voice of the voiceless, and especially bringing those experiences to the table. So when, when I was, you know, the WAG's focal point for the generation equality process, I could have just, you know, sat in the youth tassels and done absolutely, you know, not really taken back anything back to the movement. But it was a question of, would I only just have myself in, in these spaces, but can I also create a space where more girls and young women can come into the whole process and have their voices heard? So even though it was all a volunteer capacity and, and had to put a lot of effort, but I took that extra step to create that global body of more than 300 girls and young women from 33 countries in the age group of 11 to 30 years, 
really being able to engage in that process. And of course, I managed to have some of these adolescent girls as young as 12 years, you know, 13 years to really bring them to the, to the, to the panel discussion, to have their voices heard. So it really takes you kind of a lot of work at the same time when you, when you really want to have all of these voices represented and included in these spaces. But it's, it's at the end, it's worthwhile because you know that you really tried your best to bring those voices heard and, and ensure that they, they, they have uh, the ability to access that space. So not necessarily you can just create a group, but you also have to build their capacities, take them through that advocacy training and, and that journey where they are prepared to be able to contribute their ideas in, in a meaningful way. Um, so I think it was a, a journey for me, you know, going starting as, as a youth advocate myself, just at the age of 18, 19, now to be able to create that space for more girls and young women to get into these um, global spaces and, and how they can work, you know, with their national governments and authorities and, and really take that global level to back to the national level and take that action there and have and drive their advocacy campaigns at, at a national local level. Um, I also see some questions um, in, in the chat. And I think one is questioning around what are the creative ideas you have used to speak up about gender issues, decision-making rights for girls with your governmental agencies. I think, like I said, it's sometimes you feel like shaking them and saying, don't you get, don't you understand, uh, you know, this is what needs to be there. But they, they try to sometimes avoid you. And I have gone through a couple of experiences where, you know, when I was in New York and, and had to kind of get in touch with the, 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 the national delegation from my government, I, I, you know, there are circumstances where I had to stay in, in the permanent mission for like three, four hours just to speak to one person. You know, it was like, you know, them taking you through a, a total different ride. But I think the, the, like I said, the, your motivation, your passion towards the cause, and you re, if you really want to make that change happen, you also sometimes have to go through a certain bit of struggle. I'm not trying to justify what they're doing is correct or not. I'm just telling you what the, the reality has been for me. And, you know, of course, sometimes you have to be a little... Uh, you know, use your own kind of negotiating skills and influencing skills to be able to really convince them because they're not really easily convincible, especially the government uh, delegations in, in, in these uh, governmental processes. Even when you come back from a experience like CSW or, or even a DJ, you also need to constantly keep following up and like engaging with your your delegations and your authorities. I think, I mean, not necessarily creative, these are like also very basic, but things that have worked my way and I can speak from my experience. Um, and it's, it's important to keep that connectivity with them to for them to also know that you are not just that person who would just you know say hi bye and this is my thing and I and then you know in, end of the day you get lost from the whole thing, but you need to kind of keep that um, uh, connectivity going on and build up on it. So when when you move from one uh, process to another, you often meet the same kind of set of people. So you already has made that network or connection. And I think it's also important at the same time to work together with other young people, other youth activists, other civil society organization in your countries or in your region together because you know it kind of gives you that more more uh, support more strength more power to kind of influence those decision makers so these are some of those you know experiences i could share but of course like we heard our individual journeys could be very different but uh, at the end of the day i'm sure with in terms of decision makers these are some of the common experiences that i've heard from most of the youth activists, you know, not just necessarily from our region, but even from other regions. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, is, is, is useful for some of y'all who are working um, on this. And I, I also see um, another question about what had initially inspired you to be an advocate towards gender inequality. Um, I think for me as, as, a, as a young girl, back when I was just, you know, 17, 18, I come from a background where I didn't even know what gender the word means. So just imagine not having that comprehensive sexuality education in the school because it was a chapter that was, you know, just brushed through because it, it brings that stigma and, you know, uh, it's, it's a taboo topic. So not even in my, you know, my 
family background we don't you know we we never openly my parents never spoke about these uh, issues openly with uh, with me so the my girl guide experience actually enabled because you know girl guiding uses non formal education curriculums where you kind of try to take them through uh, in in a way that you build their skills and their capacities to understand some of these social issues so through that i was able to go through that advocacy trainings and and build my awareness so eventually i learned about what these issues are but also as as a young woman i i have experienced myself you know sexual harassment in public spaces in in taking the buses but i never knew that i must say no at that point or take action because like i said i don't come from that background so when i learn about this when i when my capacities were built then i said i understood that this is something we should stand up for speak out for and then you know say no to it so that's when I, that that's when it really struck me that i shouldn't be only speaking about myself but i should be calling out and speaking out for all the girls and young women in the world who are going through such experiences not necessarily sexual har- harassment in public spaces who are who faces rape sexual violence you know economic injustice even being uh, you know subjected to a place where their education is not necessarily considered important whereas the the male um you know siblings are given more importance and they are being uh, uh, you know asked to stay back at home to take care of the other siblings and and not given uh, enough equal opportunities in the world so there were so many issues that i came across that really made me really um passionate about um to to work on these issues especially related to gender equality um so i think uh, that kind of sums up what i want to say and whoever is listening whether it's adolescent girls or young women or generally adolescent and young people my call out is actually to to access these opportunities really claim that space you all have and and um you know go for it and i'm sure people will hear your voices and there will be so many people coming forward to stand in solidarity with you and to really support your advocacy and activism so with that thank you thank you so much shanti as always it's always a privilege to hear you speak i'm so passionate about some of the issues that you are absolutely talented about as well um but i guess we've finally come to the end of the session and it has been an absolute pleasure and privilege moderating this morning session i want to thank our three incredible panelists darren paul um nalini singh and uh chamathia fernando for their um dedication passion and profound um dedication towards um participating in creating an equitable future for um young women girls adolescents um everyone in this world so i truly thank you for your um time in promoting um active engagement um if they can follow up with any anything that you've written so please do keep um an eye out for that but now i'd like to thank you all for listening into session 5 and i'd like to hand it back over to the incredible jivika thank you everyone thanks sara that was really really inspiring to hear all of you talk about your journeys talk about what the challenges have been and how to go forward you know in these formal processes as well and we hope to hear more of all of you in the uh, you know call for action session as well i just want to take a minute before i actually jump into um, you know an exciting segment with young co travelers of mine is to say that we have gather town if we could just project it um, uh, sara gather town is an app that we are using to sort of connect informally in this space it's something that many of you have used for the last two days but we just want to again introduce it to you if you haven't you can enter gather town you can have conversations you can have video conversations you can actually sit around uh, rooms chairs um, spaces and actually engage with those who you find interesting so all of you who have been asking chamatya all these great questions make sure you grab a room with chamatya after this to have a conversation about this um in the last one hour after today's closing plenary so we are going to open this up in the last one hour we request you to stay back because you know it is the last day we want you to interact with others now what is a youth conference a youth meeting without being able to connect interpersonally as well to take these um issues forward so yeah i just wanted to introduce that um also go go grab a tea or coffee for a minute we are going to in our break listen to some inspiring speakers who are going to be able to tell us about how 
you know, one is to claim space within existing spaces, but the other is how do you create spaces for those who don't fit in? And I think those who've been working on the issue of disability have been disabled themselves, are looking at gender equality, generation equality from a lens of the disabled. And it's a, it's a constituency that we cannot miss anymore. And as a national gender youth activist, that's been my biggest learning in the last one year. So I invite all my panelists and I request for all of them to be paid. The first one, of course, is Sylvain, a dear friend, of, um, a co-traveler, a national gender youth activist, and a member of the Generation Equality Task Force. Thank you for being here in the middle of your night, Sylvain. Um, he's also assistant coordinator for the Young African Leaders Initiative in Democratic Republic of Congo, and also um, leads a national coordinator for Enable the Disabled Action Organization. He's been involved in matters of human rights, gender inclusion, and involvement of young people in decision-making groups. So yeah, welcome to the panel, Sylvain. I'd also like to call in our second panelist for the day, an adolescent girl who's been absolutely inspiring in this process and has led Jeff from the front with the group of adolescents, who's even questioning youth, um, and all other youth, including me, to think about them and center them in these spaces. Um, Isadora is a 16-year-old uh, from Chile who was born at six months gestation, which caused her to have cerebral palsy and spastic uh, diplegia type. She's an ambassador of Teleton Chile in 2011 and has been advocating for uh, disability rights and gender equality since the age of nine. Um, you know, she's an activist for inclusion, founder of an organization called Exuentra to Ligor and helps people with disabilities find inclusive and accessible spaces. Uh, she's definitely been challenging me on some of the ways I look at inclusion and coming together to highlight these issues within the just space and uh, is an absolutely inspiring inspiring person. Um, and of course, the third one is a co-traveler and a national gender youth activist, um, you know, uh, Almira, who's also from uh, West and Central Africa, who's been a survivor of sexual abuse and has overcome her trauma to go ahead and walk with you. She's, uh, she's also someone who works with the disability space. And of course, the executive director at such a young age of Smart Women's Initiative and continues to advocate and challenge us to look at how disabled people can come in. So yeah, welcome all of you to looking at how we talk about disability, even in our spaces as young youth, because I don't think we have those uh, discussions enough. Um, yeah, and I also want to just begin with you, Sylvain. Um, you know, as a member of the Youth Task Force, I was just wondering, um, you know, what comes to your mind, uh, first to you when we say, how can you, women and youth with disabilities participation in, participate in such forums like the Generation Equality Forum? Um, you know, or in other forums like this, and how do we center them? Um, and Sylvain, please go. Feel free to answer in French as well. Um, and all of you, please switch on interpretation if you need it, so that you can listen in to what Sylvain has to say. Sylvain, over to you. Merci, merci beaucoup, Jovic. Je suis heureux d'être ici avec vous tous. Et je vous remercie également pour uh, cette question. Uh, premièrement, je veux commencer par, par reconnaître les efforts qui ont, qui ont été consentis jusqu'à jusqu présent. Uh, mais je peux dire qu'il y a encore beaucoup de choses à dire à faire dans le cadre d'avoir dans le cadre d'avoir une participation significative pour les, les jeunes et les femmes handicapées. Parce que la participation voudrait dire la reconnaissance de l'expertise. I think there's a challenge, Sylvain, one second with interpretation. Um, English interpretation, can you just check again? Uh, we can take the time. I think it's important to take the time to do this. One second. Um, you can change the language in French and just check if it works, everybody. Uh, Sylvain, can you say something in French and then we'll try and see if it works? Bonjour. Everyone, please select the French channel. I think the interpreter is sitting in the French channel if you want to listen to Sylvain. Um, sorry for the confusion. Sylvain, give us a minute. Yeah, 
Sylvain, you can go ahead. How do we center youth um, in these spaces like the Generation Equality Forum and what's been your experience? Oui, au fait, j'étais en train de parler sur euh, la, la participation des femmes handicapées et des jeunes au processus de, de forum Génération Égalité avec mon expérience comme youth d'accord. Et j'avais dit au fait que cette participation devrait normalement inclure, inclure le, le processus dans un clip, ouais, avec une légitimité perçue au processus multi-acteur, cette participation qu'on parle ici pour les, les jeunes handicapés et les femmes reste très symbolique. Et très limitée à des déclarations et intentions. Parce que la participation devrait inclure la prise de décision, le leadership, l'élaboration des stratégies, la copropriété dans le développement. Et dans la mise en œuvre des fonds, dans la mise en forme du forum Génération Égalité. Malheureusement, les féministes handicapés étaient rarement inclus. Et que les questions liées à l'intersection du genre et du handicap était rarement abordée. I think Sylvain has frozen, but I will put in uh, what he's saying into English. I do have the French version of it. I have put it in. Um, you can move back to English if you need to. Uh, we will try and get him back, but I will put the entire chat into it. What he seems to say is that there's no point uh, participating just for tokenistic um, you know, endeavors. We must look at how do we look at, um, you know, while we are a tiny faction in making us um, center, uh, centering us is very important. And while we're really included, what we need to do is accessibility, have sign language, have young people uh, within us speak about how they could do it differently, learn from our strategies, make sure that we are not limited to declarations, but also to decision-making, leadership, co-developing strategies within this as well. So yeah, just, in, just I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, I'd like to bring in the second, um, Panelist, someone, of course, who's been challenging me to look at her young people differently. Isadora, um, I just wanted to ask you, actually, uh, you know, I've been hearing you uh, bleed from the front during Jeff. How do you think intersectionality applies to women and girls with disability? And what can we do to sort of, you know, foreground this? Well, thank you, Yevika, for the question. I wanted to start telling you what intersectionality means because we talk about this, but what it means? Intersectionality is a concept to serve to analyze the characteristics of each person and how this can affect the possibilities of exclusion or having a better situation. And about girls and women with disabilities, this concept applies at perfection to their case because what this concept wants you to realize is that at the moment that you are taking action or doing something to improve your community, you should consider the reality of each woman with the differences that she has, 
Unfortunately, when the authorities make decision, they don't think about it. They only consider one type of person with one's necessity, and that's why the needs of women and girls with disabilities are left out in the most of cases. This is terrifying because the intersectionality is general, it doesn't apply to the solutions that we need for inclusive for an inclusive world. Absolutely, Isadora. I mean, I completely agree with you about an inclusive world. And I'm just wondering, how do we make it more inclusive, Isadora? What would what has your journey been around this? Um, you know, how have you managed to come into this? You know, your own journey is inspirational. Do you want to tell us a little more about your own journey? Well, I wanted to start telling you that I create a, an organization that's the main objective is to involve people with disability and with inclusion. I create a concept that is inclusive Asian. This person uh, do different actions. First, uh, I don't know, looking for places like schools, like universities, like jobs. But the main thing here is to involve them because when you are involved in a problem, you want to find a solution. But in the majority of cases, or in the most of cases, people, it's not interesting because they are not suffering this problem. But how about if we involve them in the solution and being part of the inclusion, empowerment of all our young people? Because young people, in the most of cases, think that because of their age or their possibilities, they are unable to do solutions for the world. But that's not true. We can be empowerment, we can do solutions and create a better world. So we have to empower ourselves and believe that inclusion is possible because inclusion is the social model that, uh, that is able to us to give the tools and assets to improve the world and to improve us because everybody is different and everybody needs different tools and assets, of course. <laughs> Completely agree. Everyone is different. We must include instead of designing for someone, look at differences, look at how to include. I think absolutely. I, I think it's something that we need to reflect on much more as we call, go ahead with a call for action to look at such marginalized groups, uh, you know, and within that also young, young girls. Um, I request you all to just mute yourself if you're not um, you're speaking because it would disturb the speaker. And I've also put in uh, the, uh, the response that Sylvain gave us. And I will bring him in for another question very shortly, but it's in the chat for all of you to read as well. Um, I just want to bring in Amira into this conversation. Um, you know, Amira, you work with uh, very closely with youth with disabilities on issues of gender inclusion. And I'm just wondering, how do you make the processes more inclusive for girls and women with disabilities? What are your ways? What are your strategies? Have you done this? Could you speak to us? A little more about that. And you're on mute. You're on mute, Amira. Amira, you're on mute. My bad. Hi, That's everyone. Um, so I'm actually going to keep my video off because of the um, bandwidth, so I can be able to stay connected. Um, so I have been working as a women, girls, and disability rights activists for quite some time now. And over the past years, um, these are things I keep waking up to every single morning, like one day you will lose your hearing. Probably you marry a hearing impaired person, or like, what do you find interesting to work with hearing and speech impaired persons? These are the questions or the words that I wake up to every single morning. And sadly in Sierra Leone, Hearing and speech impaired persons are mostly referred to as mumu, as an M-U-M-U. And it's, it's a little bit frustrating because um, this term does not only define the hearing impaired person, but is, it is also used to describe a stupid person. You know, in a society like Sierra Leone, it's, it's, it's quite burdensome to become a woman. Certainly in this part of the world where I come from, Violence in all facets have been normalized and being a woman has automatically make you a prey to, to um, perpetrators. Um, if you listen keenly when Javika introduced me, she mentioned me being a survivor of sexual child abuse. So I'm no stranger when it comes to this field. And this tells you that in Sierra Leone, it's, 
it's just a normal thing that happens on a regular basis. We have women and girls that suffer from rape, sexual, domestic abuse. And it's, it's, it's just like, if, if you dare mention a girl or let's say an adult who suffers from sexual abuse or domestic abuse, the normal trend or the normal saying you hear is like, what was she wearing? Oh, why was she in the company? of male friends. So society tends to judge us being a woman. So that is exactly the reason why, what, what makes it really hard for, um, for us to become a woman. Let's just narrow, narrow it down a little bit to female living with disability. And that tells you that being a woman in Sierra Leone, I'm, I'm deliberately using Sierra Leone because that is the context that I am of to and I have been working closely with women with disability in Sierra Leone. It makes it twice hard. One, for being a woman, and two, living with disability. You know, being a woman, it's, it's a little bit frustrating in this country because our society has structured it in a way that it's, it's, quite, it's quite heavy for you to just navigate your way throughout. I think it was um, Chamanta, she mentioned about experiencing um, sexual abuse some days when she could hop in in a bus. These are normal stories. Let me just bring in my story. Sometime last year in February, I walked in, um, in a government office and then I bumped into one of our, our former deputy minister in this country. And now he has been upgraded to a full minister. This is someone that I know, he's no stranger to me. And we had like two or three minutes chat in his colleague's office. And then he invited me to his office. I went to his office. Upon leaving, I just found this man pleasurably spanking my butt. And when I decided to take up this issue, it was so frustrating and hard to hear women castigating and blaming me, asking me questions like, why did you go to, to our office? So imagine women living with disability, it's twice hard to speak up or break the silence. Let's, let, let me narrow it down to the um, educational facets in Sierra Leone when it comes to persons living with disability. Um, so the Sierra Leone National School for the Deaf was established in 1963. And Currently, the school is the oldest deaf school in the country and has 13 teachers. Out of these 13 teachers, we have two hearing impaired teachers. And out of these 13 teachers, we have two senior teachers who quite recently had to um, undergo a training on special needs education. This tells you that eight out of 13 teachers in the Sierra Leone National Association, uh, Sierra Leone School for the Deaf, uh, have little or no knowledge when it comes to issues, when it comes to disability issues, not to mention sign language. So we're left with a question of how do they teach kids who are hearing impaired? It's, it, these are just like the normal challenges we face in Sierra Leone. And I remember um, speaking to a friend, a deaf friend quite, quite recently on Friday. And once we were having a conversation, I just have this kind of random thoughts in my head asking her like, okay, so if you have a chance to um, meet God for just a minute and God gives you the privilege to, uh, to make one wish, what would it be? I was quite shocked by her response. Her response was like, all I need is for me to have the power to go to school and have equal opportunity and access in this country and help other people like myself. Why I said I was quite shocked because I thought the first thing that she could have said was, I wish to gain my hearing. But then I asked her, aren't you thinking or planning of gaining your hearing? She said, no. I'm okay the way I am. I don't think I have any problem. The problem does not lie with us. The problem lies with them. I was a little bit curious to know who the them are. And she was directly referring to us here in, here in person. I'm like, what do you mean by the problem lies with us? She said, we can speak. The only difference is we use our hands to speak. The problem is 
the society does not cater to understand our language and the society does not make the effort to learn and come into our space and provide a much more disabled friendly environment. Let's go, let's let, let's just reflect our mind quite recently about a year ago when we when we, we, we were stuck with the pandemic, we're still within the pandemic phase, right? I stand to be corrected, but over a year now since the pandemic started, I have seen hundreds of COVID messages, COVID um, awareness messages, but I haven't seen none that communicates those messages specifically for hearing and speech impaired persons. And I'm afraid equality may not be achieved if we fail to be inclusive in our work. This means we have to provide equal access and opportunity for all persons. We should be intentional in creating disabled friendly environments. So um, in conclusion, if we have to think about um, how we can make or how we can have a disabled friendly environment, this comes down to us thinking about the financial investments in restructuring the world. And this should be a conscious effort everyone should make. It should be, um, it should be a conscious effort that everyone should make. And I, I mostly reflect on the international space as well as the national space. Um, for instance, when we think about um, our lawmakers, for instance, uh, let's say parliament is passing laws, we have to ensure that we hold our leaders accountable to, to ensure all of those laws or every materials or information that has been drafted have a disabled friendly material or message for persons living with disabilities, specifically hearing speech impaired as well as visual impaired. Because most of those materials that have been developed, we fail to provide for persons living with disability. And this makes it really, really hard for us to include them in what we do. Speaking of um, tokenism, um, I wasn't part yeah, of the- have, I'll give you 30 seconds more because I do ah. want to bring in the other <laughs> panelists. And then no the next problem. session, yeah. So if you could just that quickly, I'm very. I was just listening to you in gross. Yeah, go ahead. No, no problem, no problem. Um, so I was thinking about the um the the Jeff the just concluded um Paris Forum, which I was not fortunate to keep up with, but um, having hearing stories from colleagues, we're left with questions like how do they want the world to be an inclusive space? Because imagine being an able person, an able young woman, we are faced with a regular challenge. I think it was, um, I can't remember her name again, but there was uh, the first speaker who mentioned the patriarchal society we live in. These are the challenges we face on a, on a daily basis. And in order for us to penetrate into these spaces and make the changes, we have to be intentional in what we do. We have to hold our leaders accountable. We have to, we have to shift from just mere talk in, but ensure that we keep the action alive. So I think for me not to monopolize, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Amira. I think keeping the action alive, and as Jyotsna Dalit feminist um, and the first speaker that you're referring to said, we must hold ourselves to account. Uh, just quickly, Isadora and Sylvain, you have, uh, you know, first Isadora and then Sylvain. What is the one thing you would do to make, you know, um, youth, what can youths do to make this more inclusive? You know, how can we include um, and understand people with disabilities better? Uh, Isadora, just, and then Sylvain. Thinking that inclusion, it's the only asset for creating a diverse world. All of you are different and your difference is the thing that it's gonna build a better world. And your age, it's not an impediment. I created an app when I was 13. So <laughs> that's not an impediment for you. You are amazing. You have to boil for that difference and amazing things that you are doing. Okay. Sylvain, what do you think youth can do to make this more inclusive? You know, we've been talking about others. Um, yeah. Au fait, dans le même sens qu'a dit Isdor, c'est sûr que pour que ce monde soit plus inclusif et diversifié, ça doit commencer par nous les jeunes. Et c'est là 
en, 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 en prenant en compte l'inclusion ou les handicaps dans toutes nos planifications euh, et toutes les mises en œuvre des programmes que nous serons en train, en train de faire. Si cela est fait par nous, les jeunes, les jeunes générations, je pense qu'on va y arriver. Parce que je me suis toujours dit, si on avait fait ceci 25 ans après, on ne serait pas en train de vivre ces mêmes problèmes aujourd'hui. Yeah, thank you. I think, Sylvain, absolutely. Uh, and it's great to see. I know you had a huge challenge even reaching Jeff and you couldn't. And as a disabled person, uh, you've still uh, managed to come back and tell us to keep doing and keep trying as youth and make sure we center disabled processes. So I'm absolutely inspired. And thank you to all three of you to cent for centering this conversation and coming in. I know there are many from this region who've been talking, uh, uh, who are at this forum, who want to speak about this as well. Avinash, I hear you. In the last one hour when we go into gather town i request isadora sylvain and amira to also join us there we'll have a conversation in one of the rooms to take forward uh, the disability conversation and avinash will definitely hear you there um i am going to because we do have you know very creative sessions coming in next i am going to move on to the next segment though um and see how we can take deepen these conversations and scale for impact um so i just want to put the uh, I want to introduce the two moderators for the sessions, um, both my dearest friends and colleagues from the Youth Task Force. Chamatya, who's also, you, all of you know her, so I'm not going to take too much time. She's going to lead a room, um, you know, with other partners who are looking at uh, the National Coalition of Girl Rights and Sparkling Wellbeing and the Afghan Young People's Coalition, um, you know, who's been Afghan Youth Network, who's actually leading this space. And we're going to have another room, which is going to be moderated by Satoko, um, a YWCA leader from Japan, and of course, the loudest voice from feminist leadership from the Generation Equality Youth Task Force in the Asia Pacific. Um, and, the, and that room is going to look at, you know, two interesting initiatives by the YWCA Korea and Zonta Nepal Club of Kathmandu working with young people. Um, so just to again, and we will project all the speakers on my screen in two minutes, just to say that we are going to request you all to go into breakout rooms. Each of the, I mean, these are two breakout rooms and you will get to go to both. So we have 30 minutes for one and 30 minutes for another. We request you to choose room one or two in the first round and then choose the other one uh, for the second round. How you can do this, if I'll just run you through how you can choose your breakout room. At the bottom of your screen, you will see an icon saying breakout room. If you can see it, please give me a thumbs up. Um, you know, use the reaction button, make sure you do it. And from that breakout room button, click the first room if you want to first hear, um, you know, the stories from Afghanistan and from other spaces, um, which is being co-led by Chamatya and moderated. And if click on room number two, if you want to actually go and listen to the inspiring story of work done by YWCA and our friends in Nepal. All of these are looking at how can we deepen within our communities work on youth. Um, and you will get to attend both sessions. So after 30 minutes, we will repeat the session in the room. So request you to stay for 30 minutes in one room. After that, you can go back to your breakout room icon and choose the other room. So if you're in one, choose two. If you're in two, choose one. You'll have to go to the bottom of the breakout room and just click join on the other room. So if you're in room one, as you can see on my screen, you just click on join room two. You'll also have Chamatya and Satoko sort of moderating this in the room for you as well, as well as You'll get to hear some inspirational speakers. We also request you to open closed captioning because if some speakers are speaking in Nepali, we may not have translation interpretation, but we will have the captioning at the bottom. So as soon as you go in at the bottom of your screen, you'll see live transcript. Go there and enable it. You can also do it right now before you jump into your breakout room. With that, I'm just going to bring back what we're doing in this session. So. Room one is a National Coalition of Girls' Rights and an Afghan youth network who's leading a conversation of what they can do there. Um, Avinash, don't worry, we have the interpretation sorted, but thank you. You can just type it in chat as well if you like, that would be really helpful. Um, and uh, room two is, of course, YWCA Korea, who's been doing some amazing work around Me Too, and also the Nepal Club of Kathmandu, and the moderators will introduce them further. Choose your room, we are opening the rooms now. 
uh, please feel free to go into them. Uh, we're just opening them. Can you tell me in your own words how you see the climate crisis affecting your country? What do you see is happening? Cyclone Winston was the strongest cyclone ever struck Fiji. I saw houses blown away. Our school was destroyed. I was visiting family back in Northern California when the Paradise Fire broke out. I had to roll up my towels, put them under windows and doors since the smoke was seeping into my home. We heard voices screaming outside. We just um, stand outside praying for the fire not to reach our homes. Many people died. Our farms were destroyed. Our crops were washed away. I really saw like flooding and ice caps melting. The summers are really, really hot. The snow melts immediately. In the rainy seasons, when it should rain, it doesn't rain. And sometimes it's raining uh, that much that the river uh, comes up to danger mark. Every time we have these heavy rains, uh, our school closes. The economy is really impacted. All the memories that were made in that place, like the places where we used to have fun and enjoy, are slowly disappearing. I was on school and then I heard about climate change. I saw um, many people talking about, uh, about it on social media. I started to see how communities were being impacted all around the world. And then I was asking myself, like, what was happening? I just wanted to contribute and help out. Who inspired me was Greta Thunberg. Greta and her movement. She's just straight to the point and she's not afraid to speak up for what she believes. My name is Greta Thunberg. I'm 16 years old and I'm a climate activist from Sweden. I learned more and more about how serious the situation was. I couldn't understand why everyone else was just continuing like before, not doing anything, not caring about this. We deserve a safe future, and we demand a safe future. Is that really too much to ask? The boss and the girls are like us kids and they don't really take us seriously. Some people, they don't even think about it. They're saying, oh, you're too young for this, you're not supposed to be doing this. They don't really understand the climate crisis, so they need to know the climate science. What keeps me going, despite the challenges, is that I'm in solidarity with so many activists all around the world. All the other activists who are fighting every day, I think they inspire me a lot. I want other young people not to think of uh, how young are they or how small are they. We can do something about this. If we really want to make a change, it's about like every person individually. Our future, the kids' future will be affected. It's happening right now. We're already late on our schedule. We live in the same planet. We have to come together. It's not an option. As the climate crisis continues to get more urgent, we want you to all take action as well and make your voices heard too. I don't want to just stand aside and watch. I want to participate. I want to push as hard as I can in the right direction. And I've just decided to do everything I can. Welcome back, everyone, to the main plenary. Um, we are also now looking at coming to an end of three exciting days and looking at what are the actions that are emerging out of this. And since you already know the two, um, I'm not going to reintroduce them. I'd invite in Chamatya and Sotoko to take us through the key actions that have emerged over the last few days. And we can look at how we sort of, you know, what is our call for action as youth? What are we seeing this going forward? Uh, Chamatya, uh, Sotoko, why don't you just come in and jump in and tell us what we're going to do next? Hi everyone, hi everyone, um, and maybe Shamati might be joining me as well. Uh, hi everyone, once again, this is Sotoko. I am a program coordinator at YWC of Japan and also a program uh, a member of Generation Quality Youth Task Force. Shamatia, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Shamatia Fernando, based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, a member of the Generation Equality Youth Task Force, but also a member of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, the largest voluntary organization for girls and young women, with a membership of 10 million in 152 member countries in the world. 
So, Jamatya, Sutoko, what's coming out of these sessions? What are you What are you hearing? What do you think is the next? What do you both believe is the next call to action? How are we going to take this forward as youth in the region, at the regional level, at the local level? Is there something that's emerging over the last three years? Uh, three days and of course the last one year that, that we need to take action on and you think you can sort of co-lead with all of us national youth gender activists so many young people on these you know sessions across globally and in the region who've been sort of you know speaking up speaking out so yeah and then what do you think I think um, I think one thing we need to realize is that we constantly hear a call out from young people and adolescents from across the world. I think in different spaces, and especially in 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 this particular event, we saw that very strongly coming out from the Asia Pacific region. Uh, it's also it was also I think it's important to uh, realize that we, the the kind of uh, stories we heard was not necessarily only from the region. I think we went across uh, regions to bring these um, stories and 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 lived realities of um, you know adolescents and young people from from these different processes back into relating it to how it could really be like for us in in the Asia and the Pacific region. Um, from the the discussions we've had today, I think some of the major points we are getting is how how we should have meaningful adolescent and youth engagement in any of these processes. I think not necessarily limiting ourselves um, to you know, the generation equality, but beyond that, how should adolescents and young people should be meaningfully engaged? And I think the leadership that we want it to be a co-owning space, a co-leading space, they need to have the power and equal opportunity to set the agenda. We don't necessarily be, be you know, this tokenized uh, group of people who would be just sitting in the table and just to put a vote or say yes to something that's already being decided. We want to set the agenda. We, we need to be co-designers along with uh, everybody else and be equal partners. So I think I, I constantly hear it across so many spaces. And that, that also is a very cross-cutting area that's coming across different you know, thematic issues as well. So even if you take an example of the action coalitions we have, irrespective of which the thematic area is, I think people are demanding um, you know, the, the actions to be taken to put meaningful youth leadership and engagement in, in place. Uh, so that's one critical area, but I think we can go back and forth with myself and sort of bring in some elements into it, yeah. Do you want to just jump in? Sure. Um, while or uh, before I speak, start to speak, I actually uh, wrote something in the chat box. Uh, I would like to ask all of all of the participants, all of us, to think about, uh, think back the last three days of this forum and what stand out for you, what really reminds you, what's really important lesson that you have learned uh, in the last three days, and then uh, let me know uh, in the, through the chat box. And uh, for me, the, it was really wonderful to have had this three days of the forum, which was full of mutual learning and sharing experiences and sharing experiences of insight. And now we are uh, thinking together of what's next with young people and those mentoring young people in Asia Pacific region, which is a very diverse region. Uh, when on the first day, I had a really important learning. We dug in we dug deep into what feminist leadership and what feminist activism means by. And for that, we analyzed the power in various dimensions. Uh, for me and Jamatia and also Dalen and Dala and Sylvain and all the members of uh, Generation Equality Youth Task Force, as well as uh, Jibika and other NGYA member members and Action Coalition uh, youth leaders, actually, uh, it has been very difficult uh, two years uh, since the beginning of our journey of generation equality processes. And with that two forums, uh, one in Mexico in March and one in France in um, uh, uh, this month, uh, July, generation equality forum journey is going to end very soon. Uh, in the two years of intergenerational and multi-stakeholder journey, I, it was really tough. Uh, even though Generation Equality Forum claims, claims to center stage young people, puts us young people at the center of this all the processes, young people has 
many times power is excluded due to the power dynamics, power imbalances located within the generation quality uh, processes. Uh, youth involved in Jeff have, that's why collectively developed the Young Feminist Manifesto, uh, which you should already know by now, and in which we demanded to analyze the power imbalances and counter it in order to make youth leadership a reality, not just a youth mayor uh, participation, but youth leadership, youth ownership. And although our generation quality forum journey is going to end soon, uh, Act for Equal period will start led by Action Coalition leaders for the next five years. And at the Paris Forum that took place from the June uh, 30 to July 2nd, 1,100 commitments were made and 40 billion US dollar was committed. That was amazing. With the commitment and money, what we need right now is accountability, definitely. If this commitment will be effectively taken into action, how this process of making commitment into action would look like, how to make sure it's transparent, co-led by young people, reflected on the need from the local and community level, how to make sure to hold non-youth people accountable to address and young people's leadership and co-ownership in that action coalition processes. How to evaluate the actions considering the substantial lack of data, data on the life experiences of women and gender diverse people? Where this huge money, $40 billion, go to, given the fact that less than 10% of gender focused aid go to women's led organizations usually, and especially to those in donor countries, not, on, not to the uh, local level feminist organization? Uh, on the second day, uh, on the Action Coalition thematic uh, theme sessions, I attended the Women's Peace and Security Compact session, and uh, in which they were calling for the youth organization and the civil society organization to be a part of signatory and make action uh, as a part of the Women's Peace and Security agenda. There is a kind of, this kind of very concrete way to be a part of the next five year journey. Uh, but what we all can do right now, or rather what is really needed collectively, is to be, is to hold accountable to each other to the next five years of journey, uh, from pointing out the power imbalances, keeping claiming the spaces and money for youth and adolescent activists across all the intersectionality, making spaces for those who are previously excluded, including the people with disability, and speaking to the government and other authority to make tangible changes, not just a commitment, but really make changes. It's really time to act. And it's such a privilege to have talked uh, with all of you in the past three days. And I also learned in the past day that uh, uh, feminist leadership is all about love and compassion and self-care is important. So keeping all these uh, keywords in mind, I would really love to uh, in solidarity with all of you to keep up our passion and great works in the next five years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Otoko. And I think, Chamatya, do you want to come in? Because I think you've yeah. had so much of the principles and, you know, what we need to keep doing and some of the commitments about money and also Chamatya. Touched upon, I think Sadoko touched upon major elements of what we actually try to capture even in our Young Feminist Manifesto because the kind of frustrations, the kind of experiences we had in the whole process, we kind of tried to bottle it down to these demands or these call to actions. We wanted to ensure that you know, there's co-ownership, co-leadership, the, the agenda setting power, the accountability mechanism, the framework that we wanted it to be, you know, um, have youth voices setting it up. But we also wanted all these processes to be, uh, you know, inclusive, to be diverse, to have the intersectionalities covered. I think all of that. But I think going a little beyond that, my call to action is also to all the young people and adolescents. I think this is our opportunity. This is the generation that will make the change happen. So as young people, I don't think opportunities will come into us in a, in a silver platter, you know? We need to claim our space. If they don't give us, we go out there, we get it for ourselves. And we make sure our voices are heard and are taken into consideration and put into action.
So my call to action is also to us, all of us young people. I know all of us are working very, very hard, but let's put that extra effort and go that extra mile to make sure that you know, we see the change happening because we have all, always seen, you know, we put out the, all these demands. We say, this is how it should be. These are the actions we want. But ultimately it, you know, it, 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 it is in a paper. And, and how much have we seen really coming into action or you know, turning into implementation? So now it's about us really pushing for that in, implementation and not forgetting that we need to call out for them to have equal, uh, investments for girl-led, for youth-led initiatives. Because now we know that these commitments are made, but how much of that would come into really, you know, youth-led, girl-led initiatives? So it's in our hands how much we would push for that agenda, how much we would make sure that, you know, they are keeping that lens whenever they have to allocate these resources. So make sure that you all connect with your delegations, with your governmental authorities, with your civil society organizations, with your corporations, private sector that is involved in the whole process. Connect those dots, know where to kind of pitch in, know to you know, really capture those opportunities that are available out there. Always make sure that you are engaged in all of these processes. This, I think we shouldn't consider it like national, regional, global, rather look at all these opportunities out there irrespective of which level and get involved. I think it's really, really important to be, uh, to be relevant, to be aware and to be involved in the process. So my call to action is also for everyone to really claim your space because it's, it's yours. Nobody else can say otherwise. So uh, make sure that whenever you are out there, you call out for everything that Sadoka summarized or we have been discussing across the three days to say, you know, we need co-leadership, co-ownership, correct accountability mechanisms, uh, investment that needs to come in, the agenda setting power, but also look at how we can build the capacities of adolescents and young people to be able to meaningfully contribute in those spaces. So that's also, I think, in a way, come back to us to ensure that we also leave another generation who's equipped to take on the baton and then continue this fight. And, and we will not have to wait for another 100 years to achieve gender equality, and we will accelerate our progress within the next five years and see constructive um, change happening in all our environments. And we will see that we don't have to wait uh, end of this generation to really have an equal world. We want it today and we want it tomorrow and forever. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that absolutely sums up what we began with, nothing about us without us. And if there's not enough place at the table, we create more tables as we go forward in investment, in co-leading, in co-creating, in creating it at all levels, do not we we don't work in silos. We work intersectionally, and the most marginalized voices, and you know something that's come up over the three days, the most powerless sort of centering our conversations and looking at intersections. Thank you so much. I think that's a strong call to action as we collectivize and move forward and look at this in our own countries. How do we deepen these processes and also work with UN women and other multilateral uh, stakeholders, private sector, the government, other institutions, families. As you said, they're so important communities. How do we deepen that and come back to committing to youth and those investments? And with that, thank you so much to both of you for sort of bringing that in. I'd like to bring in um, the UN Women um, Deputy Country Director of India, Nishtha, to give us the closing remarks. Uh, Nishtha is one of the youngest uh, Deputy Country Representatives of the UN across 193 countries. She's formerly been part of the country office uh, the multi-country office for India, Bhutan, Maldives as the partnership policy impact and public relations official and has also been associated with UNDP. Um, prior to this, she's worked with KPNG and American Express as an economist. She's foregrounded inclusion and talks about multi-sectoral ex uh, experiences. Nishtha has definitely led this in my country and I think at the Asia-Pacific level, UN Women India sort of led this with the Asia-Pacific office. So over to you, Nishtha, for the final remarks and how you eat, how you think we can collaborate further. And do excuse Nishtha in case she can't open her video. She's been having a challenge with opening her video. Um, Nishtha, are you here? Absolutely, I am. Jivika, can you hear me yeah. well? Yes. 
Yeah. Thank you very, very much for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you also for acknowledging the India country's leadership. Uh, but if I were to be true, it's absolutely nothing that I take credit for. I think all the credit really goes to Sanya, Krati, their team, and to you of us spearheading this conversation. And I'm really glad that you and women everywhere has been facilitative of this. And thank you everyone for being a part of uh, the three day three days youth accelerator sessions. I really want to take this opportunity to congratulate the young leaders for sharing your work, for sharing your passion, for sharing your burden, uh, and ensuring that this discussion was participatory. I do also want to take a moment to congratulate our regional office uh, in support from India and our Nepal offices for taking lead on young leaders across the region for this dialogue. Uh, when we refer to the outcomes of death in Mexico and, and France, that placed strengthening of youth voices center stage uh, as, as really the greatest priority and as non-negotiable for the transformative leap uh, on gender equality and justice discourse. I just want to highlight that uh, uh, the youth are an inevitable uh, a absolutely center stage constituency for change to happen. In fact, I would think that we together are the largest constituency of ensuring uh, change, both in terms of responsibility and also making sure that our leaders are accountable to us. Uh, I do also want, and through this process, I think it's been very, very uh, comforting. And it's also been re re the power of collectivization at the Global South level has also been very uh, uh, reaffirming, especially uh, talking about the South Asia region. I think the strengthening of political voices and advocacy agendas at, the, at global platforms, supporting regional dialogues this, like these and developing uh, allyship and solidarity and friendship across countries is the first level of change. It is also something that we inherit uh, and must learn with feminists before us as one of the key strategies that has worked to get us thus far. Uh, I acknowledge that the Jeff opening ballot that the Paris, found, Paris Forum laid the foundation of youth leadership and the youth accelerator sessions are the, therefore, in my view, most strategic and most timely to invest in alternative approaches to feminist uh, futures. UN Women, uh, both in India and otherwise, recognizes uh, each one of you as key to advancing gender equality in the feminist uh, uh, movement agenda. Again, uh, I've had the opportunity to interact with uh, this group just a few days before, I think a little before uh, the Paris Forum uh, happened. And it was indeed a delight to see the commitments that uh, all of you have been able to put and bring onto the table. And Jivika said, we probably have been able to create more tables and never has there been a moment like that in history. So I want to congratulate each one of you for creating history and for being a part of create that creation. And I do want to reaffirm you women's commitment to work with the Generation Equality Action for leaders, all of you to develop really actions and commitments to advance uh, gender equality. Uh, the one lesson that we've learned from the MPG's process is how important it is for uh, all of us to be on that table of co-creation and uh, how important multi-stakeholder partnerships are to achieve those actions. Uh, and there is absolutely no doubt that we must work together to challenge the barriers to feminist movements, including the pushback to gender equality uh, around the world, uh, of which a very big uh, part is the shrinking civil, the shrinking civil society uh, uh, spaces. Uh, Thinking, thinking, thinking back a little and really looking at the young feminist uh, dialogue that I was referring to, that was held before the Paris movement where uh, the youth led movement in India deliberated and foregrounded. Uh, some qu questions uh, on how do we strengthen and sustain a feminist movement in India? What were the challenges to the young feminist agenda? I think we've come a long way in understanding the answers to both. We've come a long way in, in, um, in, in, making in enabling and making sure there were commitments from various stakeholders to address the bo both. And uh, recognizing the youth manifesto and the call to create space and amplify the voice uh, uh, of and engage with youth local led national initiatives. I'm really glad uh, to share that as UN Women, it will be a very critical pillar of both investment, action, advocacy, and support in the next year, of, uh, in, in the in the next five year plan that we have. Uh, some of you who don't know the processes internally, uh, I do like to share that we're at the end of a five year plan 
at UN Women, but we're also at the starting of one. So this is both, this conversation, both within the country and regionally is very, very timely, uh, as this gives us a critical pillar of investment for the, uh, for the next five years. And as UN Women, I will uh, be committed, available and accessible to join with you in the journey to co-create and collaborate with the youth agendas, including specifically a roadmap for strengthening youth-led movements uh, through, I would like to say, and be very clear, technical and financial investment. Uh, uh, in building accountability frameworks, networking spaces, uh, and just spaces that we can use uh, to talk to each other. Uh, I definitely want to take uh, a second to congratulate, again, the Youth Task Force members, the National Gender Youth Advocates for leading this, both locally and globally, uh, but both from the front. It was, uh, it was really the participation of youth that made Jeff very different, very vibrant, and very full of a very, very different kind of energy. This is my almost eighth year running uh, in UN Women. And I can tell you that we've had very, very strong member state driven uh, platforms, but hardly ever have I seen the energy that Jeff has been created and has been able to spit and it's spilled over uh, really to those before us and those after us. And I think that in itself is history in the making. And I'm really glad that I'm a part of it. And I'm really glad that you've led it. So thank you very, very much. Uh, the UN Women team will be in touch with each one of you to chalk out a financial investment strategy and a technical support uh, a strategy to ensure what we do in the next five years in terms of actions uh, and commitments. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to sustained engagement with all of you. Thank you, Nishta. I see a lot of commitments coming from, from you as well. And I think that's fantastic to have an ally in this space, you know, an ally from civil society that's been with, uh, you know, an intergenerational civil society and an intergenerational UN women. I think that's fantastic as we go forward. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here, all of you part who participated over the last three days to make it possible to have this dialogue and come in and commit to actions yourself. Uh, I hope you're part of the commitment making journey. You've also signed up to be commitment makers and we'll also together look at how we can do this in our own countries, hold ourselves accountable, hold our governments accountable, hold the generation equality space accountable and also build dialogues, not once, but continue to do this as we build the five-year plan, as you said, you're inviting us in. So definitely taking on that opportunity, Nishna and uh, others. Um, with that, we come to an end of an enriching three days. Uh, if you have any comments, we invite you into Gather Town to have these conversations with us. Tell us how your three days was, if you'd like to collaborate. Uh, but in the interim, I'd like to thank a lot of people, the country offices who supported it, the UN Women Asia and the Pacific office who worked very, very hard to do this. All my co-leaders at the Generation Equality Youth Space, um, the Youth Task Force, the National Gender Youth Activists, and of course, the Action Coalition, uh, youth leaders and the civil society leaders who sort of brought the thematics alive in our region as well. And of course, last but not the least, to all of you youth who've been here and to Sidekick, who's going to continue to lead us into the informal discussions. Um, we wouldn't have been here if it, it wasn't for a beginning commitment and let's take these commitments forward. But also nothing about youth happens without informal spaces, without processes, without dialogue. So please don't leave us. Come into um, Gather Town as we go into our last day and stay in touch with us over the Young Feminist Hub. You all can sign up. Uh, we we'll, we'll sent the link yesterday. We'll put it in the chat again in a little bit. Um, and yeah, thank you very, very much for being here. With that, I close this event formally and I ask Sidekick to sort of help us navigate uh, Gather Town and see you there informally as well. Thank you. What defines a generation? Is it just about the year you were born? Or is there something more? We may have lived through different decades, different circumstances, different countries, but we all share in the global everyday push for our rights, for justice, for a world that is equal. Perhaps what defines our generation isn't our age, or our background, but the line in the sand that we have drawn. We take to the streets to speak out against discrimination 
and we work tirelessly behind the scenes. We stand up for peace. We are fed up with the war and economic justice. We start with a statement and watch it become a movement. We have come a long way, but the fight isn't over and our rights are still under assault. It is time to take action. Let us be the wake-up call the world needs. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. Be the first, the youngest, the best, and then make sure no one is left behind. When someone tries to silence you, raise up your voice. Let us wage a global struggle. Change everything or change just one thing. As long as you do something, whether you're new to changing the world or have been in the fight for a long time. Each knows exactly why we are here. We are all together, united for gender equality. And the future we create for women and girls is up to all of us.